morning, everybody. Hope you had a nice Thanksgiving. Whatever it was you were doing, it was good. Um, I also wanted to just say a word about last night. Um, this this uh, event that we have here on this property each year is um, it's such a great thing. And so for those of you who helped out, either back with the gingerbread making thing or helped with the setup or cleanup or were part of the band um, who came, who invited a friend, all of that, I just want to say thanks. You know, each year at this event, um, the mayor of Voorhees comes and brings greeting on behalf of the town um, uh, to the folks who are gathered. And he said two things that, that stuck out to me uh, last night during his greeting. The first thing he said was, you know, this event every year marks the beginning of Christmas here in Voorhees. And I thought, how cool is that, that, that this church, our church, is the place where, you know, we're kicking off this season um, here in town. The other thing that he said was, Hope Church is a blessing to our community. Hope Church is a blessing to our community. And I believe that to be true, and I think that is a wonderful thing. I am honored to be part of a church that blesses the community in which we come together. I think we bless other communities as well, obviously, but, but we're here, you know, we're physically here. And the fact that um, the leadership of the town recognizes the blessing that this community is uh, to uh, the, broader, the broader community is what the church is supposed to be. And so I just want to say my personal thanks to all of you um, who make this church a blessing uh, to folks outside of these walls, so thanks for that. Speaking of interruptions, um, <laughs> that's not a good transition, but it's the best I could do. I didn't have anything else to transition out of that with. <clears throat> but you know, life is full of them. Life is full of interruptions. There are big interruptions, there are small interruptions. Life is full of interruptions. According to Merriam-Webster Dictionary, an interruption is to stop or to hinder by breaking in. Pretty good definition. To stop or to hinder by breaking in. That's an interruption. About four years ago, that literally happened to my family, an interruption breaking in. Um, it was this time of year. Uh, it was the evening of our uh, Christmas production that we do every year with musicians and actors and so forth. And uh, so it was that evening. Marilyn uh, came over early because she had a lot of stuff that she needed to do. And so Matt and I came over later. And so by the time we were driving here, it was dark. We were coming up Cooper Road. And uh, as I'm driving up Cooper Road, out of nowhere this deer comes flying across the road right in front of me. I didn't even have a chance to hit my brakes. Boom, hit that deer. And uh, the deer did not fare very well. Drove here, got under one of the lights, and looked at the car and thought, all right, not too much damage, and uh, didn't think anything more about it. Came inside, watched this great production. Matt and I got in the car, drove back home, no sooner do we get in than my phone rings, and it's Marilyn, and she says, you're not going to believe this. Somebody broke into our car, literally broke the window out of the driver's side, and reached in, opened the door, went inside. She left her pocketbook in the car that evening, stole her pocketbook and her wallet. Talk about an interruption of breaking in, right? Well, you know how hassle that is, right? When you lose your wallet, you have to put a stop on all of your credit cards. You have to figure out what was in there. Any cash, that's all gone. Driver's license, you've got to replace your driver's license, you know, so you get to go to the DMV. That's fun. Who doesn't look forward to going to the DMV? So you're going to spend all that time there. And my car, it turns out, had a lot more damage than I knew, internal damage. And so I was without that car for a month. And uh, it cost thousands of dollars, thank goodness for insurance, but it was thousands of dollars of repair. That was one 
heck of an interruption in a season when it's already crazy busy, right? Now, not all interruptions are bad interruptions. Not all interruptions are bad interruptions. Fast forward a year, um, same time of year, I'm in my office, and my office door is almost always open, and people are in and out uh, all day long, but sometimes if, if I need uh, some quiet for study or I'm meeting with somebody, I close the door, and so when the door is closed, it means I don't want to be interrupted. And so I'm in my office, the door is closed, and I hear, Ugh. yes, and the door cracks open, and it's Sue Shaw, poor Sue, she knows, I don't want to be interrupted, but she said, there's a guy at my desk, he says he knows you, his name is Tim Tweedle. Tim Tweedle? That, I mean, it's a funny name, so you know it's, there's only one. Tim Tweedle was my roommate for two years in college. Literally, the last time I saw or heard from Tim Tweedle was 1981. Like, Tim Tweedle was here? I went, sure enough, it was Tim Tweedle. And so, interrupted my whole day, but it was a great day. We got caught up and uh, spent hours together. He had a business thing here in New Jersey. Remembered I was from Jersey, Googled me, and, and that's how we got together. Interruptions, right? They come into our lives. As we were looking this year, uh, as the preaching team, looking at the Christmas story, it occurred to us that the Christmas story is filled with interruptions. Jesus interrupting the lives of people. And so over the next five weeks, we're going to look at the lives of people that Jesus interrupted when he came to planet Earth. But then beyond that, we said, you know, not only the baby Jesus, not only his birth story was an interruption, throughout his ministry, he was interrupting people's lives. And so each week, we're going to do a side-by-side -side of people who were interrupted, one at his birth and then one during his earthly ministry. So this morning, we're going to be looking at how Jesus interrupted the life of Mary at his birth, and we, I think we can all agree that nobody's life was more interrupted that first Christmas than Mary's, right? So we're going to look at Mary, and then another Mary who was a friend of Jesus in his adult life, and see if there's some things that we can take away as we look at these two stories. So Mary was a young girl. We heard her story read to us, both Mary's. Um, she's a, a young girl, probably a young teen. Most uh, New Testament scholars would say that she was probably a young teen at the time of uh, this story. And so she had a vision for her life. We all do, right? We carry around in our minds a sense of how our life is going to go. And as a young person, you know, you have ideas about what your life is going to be like. I certainly had that. You know, I knew that I was going to have to go to high school and finish high school. I knew I was going to college because in my family that wasn't anything that was discussed. It wasn't an option. You go to college, right? So I knew that. I knew I was going to go to college out of state. I knew I was never going to live in New Jersey again. And I knew I was going to come out of college and be a marriage and family therapist. I knew what my life was going to be about. I'm sure Mary had images in her mind of what her life was going to be like. She was a young woman. She was living in the first century in Palestine in this area of Galilee called Nazareth. And so life was going to be pretty predictable. She was going to grow up in her parents' home. With her siblings, her mom would teach her the things that she would need to know about how to do life, how to uh, be a woman in that uh, time and in that place, that she would get married. In fact, when we meet her in the story, she is betrothed, in essence engaged, to a man named Joseph, a man from her town, somebody she knew well, probably knew her whole life perhaps. He was a carpenter, a good man, and uh, they were to be married. So she kind of had this sense of how her life would go. 
But then there was an interruption. And we all experience those as well. We have a plan. We have an idea of how our lives are going to go. And then there are these interruptions that come along. Mine happened on a weekend in October of 1982. For Mary, the interruption came in the form of an angel named Gabriel. She's this normal girl living a normal life, and that's the thing about people in the Bible. You know, sometimes we have this idea that these are superhuman people with these, you know, incredible lives, and, you know, they they almost take on a beyond human persona for us as we read about them in the Bible, but they were all just normal men and women, and that's true of Mary. She's living her life. She's following the plan. And then an angel appears to her. And the angel brings her greetings from heaven and says that she is highly esteemed. Wow, what is happening right now? And then the angel goes on and lays out there is this new plan for her life. This new plan that is this divine plan, this holy plan. You are to conceive and have a baby. It will be a boy and you are to name him Jesus. And he will be great. The son of the most high. And of his kingdom, his reign will go on forever and forever, and so the angel is laying out this whole plan that comes to this idea of, and his kingdom will reign forever, ever. And Mary is all the way back at the beginning going, wait, did you say I'm going to conceive? Like, how, how's that going to work? I, I'm not married, and I'm a virgin. What does that look like? And the angel goes, oh yeah, well, the Holy Spirit is going to come upon you. And you will give birth to a son. Now, I know that part of the story is a stumbling block for some in their faith. You know, like, okay, how's that work? You know, that's not the way things work. And you're right, that's not the way things work. And really, it comes down to your view of the universe. Do you believe that we live in a closed universe where everything that happens is explainable? It's observable, it's understandable at some level, and it's explainable. That's a closed universe. That's the only way that things happen. Or that there is... An open universe, meaning that this whole, complex, vast, beyond imagination universe, with all of its complexities, with all of its its, um, nuance, with all of its life and activity and all of those things, from the massive to the micro, exists because there is a creator. And if there is a creator who put it all into motion, then it's not hard to imagine that that creator could periodically break through the natural order of how things go and do something unexplainable, out of the norm, a miracle. See, the very nature of a miracle is something that's outside of the natural order of things. That's what miracles are. We use that word loosely sometimes, talking about a miracle. What's a miracle? Sometimes we talk about it in loose kinds of way that don't really capture the true nature of a miracle. We talk about the miracle of childbirth, right? I mean, in a sense, it seems miraculous. It's wondrous for sure. It is amazing, it is mind-blowing, it is breathtaking when a baby is born, but it's not a miracle. It's a very normal, natural part of the created order, right? 
So it's a wonderful thing. It's a wondrous thing. But it's not a miracle. This is a miracle. That God, through the Spirit, is creating a life in a human being. And that becomes significantly important when Jesus is a man on a cross dying for our sin. It matters who his father was. So that's the story that she hears. All of a sudden, she is caught up in this unbelievable, unplanned interruption that is forever going to change the trajectory of her life. It doesn't mean that everything's going to go great from now on. You know, sometimes we think that, wow, if God were to give me a plan for my life, that'd be great and everything would be up and to the right, it would be terrific and so forth, but that's not the case. It wasn't the case for Mary. She certainly had high moments being the mother of Jesus, but she also experienced great darkness, great difficulty, great heartache in her life as well. For me, that moment, and there have been others, and I'm sure you have moments as well, but that moment that I talked about back in October of 1982, I was working out my life plan. Now, I already knew that everything I thought wasn't going to happen because I was back in New Jersey, right? So that part was gone. I was not going to be a counselor, but I had some idea of what I wanted to do, but I had this nagging thing in me that God wanted me to go into ministry, and I didn't want to go into the ministry. God wanted me to be a pastor. I didn't want to be a pastor, but I couldn't get rid of this kind of sense that that's something that God had in mind for me, and so I finally went on this personal camping trip, a weekend camping trip uh, in October, and I was wrestling with God over this, and I was explaining to God why I thought this was a bad idea, right? I don't see myself in that role. I don't want to do this. I don't think I'm qualified. All of these things that were good reasons for me not to do this that I'm sharing with God. And in that weekend, I've shared this with you before, in that weekend, God clearly spoke and said, I'm not calling you to change. I want you to do this. You. Not somebody else. Not somebody who, uh, you know, you think should be doing the job. Not what you imagine. I want you. Here's what Mary said to the angel about God's plan. I'm all in. I'm all in. Now, the way she put it was different. She said, you know, may it be to me as you have said. But basically, that's what she said. I'm all in. If that's God's plan, I'm in. Whatever it takes, wherever it takes me, Whatever's involved, I'm all in. And that's where I got to in my story as well. All right, if this is what you want from me, I'm all in. Sometimes, friends, God's plan feels like an interruption. It feels like things are, are going out of control. And it may not be a big moment where God actually speaks and so forth, but your life, something comes in your life, and it radically changes the direction that your life is going to go. And you have the choice, you have the option to say that that's just terrible, it's disappointing, it's frustrating, I'm angry about it. You can go that way and look at your life through that lens, or you can say, God is in this. God is in this. I may not see where God is. I may not understand where this is taking me. But this I know, that God is still with me. And this new direction 
God is going to be there as well. Now, there are other kinds of interruptions. You know, some aren't that mag- huge, right, where it's going to change your whole life. Sometimes these interruptions change our priorities, right? We have a list of priorities, things that we're going to be doing and so forth, and, um, and God is going to change our priorities. And so that's where this next story comes in. We have Jesus going to the house of friends, Martha and her sister Mary. So the story uh, in Luke 10 is that Jesus and his friends are passing through a town. They realize that, oh yeah, Martha and Mary live in town. Let's stop by. Now, this is a time in life before, you know, cell phones, right? So they're not able to text ahead. Like, hey, we're in town. Can we stop by? No, it didn't work that way. They didn't have email. They couldn't say, hey, next week we're going to be in town. Would it be okay if we come? It doesn't work that way. This is in the time when you just, you know, you're out and about and you have this opportunity. And so, hey, let's go and stop by. It's so weird for our day, right? Like, what, what do you do when somebody knocks on your door anymore? Right? Hide. Yeah, I heard somebody say hide. Right? I notice in my house, you know, like if, if somebody knocks on our door or rings our doorbell, we're like, what? Did you hear that? I think there's somebody at the door. Like, oh my gosh. Who could it be? I don't know. What do you think we should do? I don't know. Answer it? I don't know. Right? It's usually a salesperson, but because we don't do that anymore, you know? You always, you call ahead, you text ahead, you know, you make plans and so forth. It didn't work that way. So, you know, Mary and Martha are in their house. I'm sure they had priorities for their day, things that they were planning on doing. You know, Martha opens the door, Jesus! <laughs> hey! Glad you're here! Hey, you know, we were just passing through, thought we would stop. Great, come on in. I don't know how many there were. Like, did he have all 12? It doesn't say. But, you know, you just imagine these guys filing in. Like, can you stay for lunch? Sure. Kate. Okay. All my priorities of the day are now changed. Right? Everything that I thought I was going to do, I'm not going to be doing. And so Martha goes into high gear, right? She's starting to figure out all that she's going to have to do in order to get a meal prepared for these guys. You know, again, there's not Uber Eats. There's not, you know, any of that kind of stuff where she can just call out, like, let me run down to Wawa, get some stuff. All this has to be made, right? So she's going to work. She's going to town, and she's putting together in her mind, you know, like, and this is perfect for a Thanksgiving story, right? Like a Thanksgiving weekend, because that's kind of what I pictured. You know, you've got all of these guests, and now you've got to feed them. And so she's working frantically, trying to get all of this stuff together and prepared and, and so forth. And, and as she's working away, you know, it suddenly occurs to her that her sister's not around. Like, she looks out, and she sees her sister in the family room with Jesus. Like, all right, I'm sure, you know, they're getting acquainted. It's good that she's being a nice hostess, but she'll be in any minute, and I'll get her to do these things while I'm doing these things. And she's working away, and and a little more time goes on, and she's like, Mary's still not coming. And she's not coming. And you can just imagine the slow burn that's starting to happen. And you're doing all this stuff, and she's... I don't know what she thinks. She's younger than I am. She ought to be. In. This is my picture of it. You know, like, I don't, this is how I think it's going. And she finally hits the limit. Mary is not coming in, and she is now ticked. And she goes into that family room, and she goes after Jesus. Right? She doesn't go after Mary. She goes after the son of the most high. Hey, Jesus, why aren't you sending her in there to help me? 
don't you care about me? Feel her pain? Right? We have all of these priorities, all of these things that we have to get done. And we get overwhelmed and maybe we get mad at God. Maybe we get mad at Jesus, right? Like, I've got all this to do, and you're not sending me help. Again, I think this is a great reminder for us in this time of year, right? December can often be the most intense uh, month of the year. Because we're trying to squeeze so much activity, so many things into this month. We've got shopping to do, presents to buy, presents to wrap. We've got uh, parties to go to, people that we want to get together with, cards to, well, <laughs> does anybody send cards anymore? Do you send cards? Because we're not getting them. Like, I remember back in the day, we used to have this giant wicker basket, and all December, like, cards would come in, and we were putting them in this wicker basket, and then as soon as uh, Christmas was over, we'd pull it out, and we'd read them all, and, you know, read the letters that came with it. It was great. Last year, I think we had two, and a couple of email, you know, like in the basket. (laughs) But we're busy, right? We're busy doing stuff. And we're missing out on the whole purpose behind it. What is it we're celebrating again? Oh, right. Jesus' birthday. So here's Mary sitting at the feet of Jesus. Martha is frantic, yelling at Jesus. And he says to her, Martha, you are worried and upset about so many things. Like, maybe, Martha, your life is out of control. Maybe you need to change your priorities. Because here's the thing, Martha. Mary has picked the more important thing. And it won't be taken from her. You've got this one moment with me. This one moment to sit, to be still, and to listen to me. It's more important than that stuff that you have going on in the kitchen. And I suspect, friends, that, you know, because eventually you got to eat. You know, they, they are still humans. They, they all have to eat a meal. I, I suspect that if Martha had just done what Mary was doing, eventually Jesus would have said, man, I'm hungry. You guys hungry? Yeah. Let's all go in the kitchen. Let's start putting together a meal. You know, and several of them would have gone in and they would have gotten it together in a third of the amount of time anyway. Without the aggravation, it all would have worked out just fine. So I wonder what it would look like for you in this season of Advent, if your priority was toward the person whose birth we celebrate rather than just on the celebration? What might look different for you if you were going to invest some real time in spending time with the Lord? And I wonder if we did that, how different our month might look and how different we might feel at the end of that month. So instead of feeling exhausted and overwhelmed and depressed and disappointed because it didn't quite measure up, if we might feel more rested and sane and whole. So life is full of interruptions. They come in all sizes and in all kinds of ways, big and small. Some that radically change 
the trajectory of your life, some that come and cause an adjustment of your priorities. But the challenge is, the opportunity is, to look at these interruptions through the lens of this may be a holy moment. This may be a divine opportunity. Maybe God is in this and I don't want to miss it. Let's stand for closing prayer. Oh, Lord, thank you. Thank you that you work through ordinary men and women like these two women, Mary, whose stories we heard this morning. Lord, you are still in the business of working through ordinary men and ordinary women who turn their attention toward you. And so, God, I just pray that in this season of Advent, as we move toward Christmas, that we would look to you, that we would look at our interruptions differently, that we would listen for your voice, and that we will see you in the day-to-day. -day. I pray these things in Jesus' name, whose birth we celebrate. And all God's people agreed and said, have a great week.